Hello, everybody. Welcome. Come on in. We're going to get started in just a little bit. Uh, the room is filling in. Hope everyone's having a great uh, start of their um, their hot back summer. I think that's the thing everyone's saying right now. I hope everyone's doing well. Hope everyone's um, starting to feel a little bit better from the past year um, and starting to get ready to, uh, you know, get slowly back to normal for those of you that are in countries that are highly vaccinated. I know we have people com coming from all over the world. So people who are in other countries that are not as highly vaccinated, I hope that you stay safe until um, it happens. Um, I hope everyone's just uh, doing great with this year. It's almost, hopefully for the lights at the end of the tunnel. I know it, for an American perspective, it looks like it's getting close to the end, but I know for other people, it might be farther. So uh, good luck folks. I hope it, hope it ends soon for everybody. First up, as we always do at this meetup, I always like to say, who is hiring? Now, as we've learned over the past year plus, you can't all jump up and shout and tell me who's hiring. So uh, what we are going to do is, if you want to hire somebody, go to the Slack channel. Um, the link for Slack, our Slack is, I'll put it right here in the chat. It's nyhackr.org. Oh man, I screwed that up already. Let me do it again, folks. Okay, that looks better. I had two slashes before. If you go to nyhackr.org slash slack.html, there's a link to join the Meetup Slack, which has lots of other stuff besides job announcements. But if you're looking to hire somebody, post it in the job postings channel, job-postings. Go in there, post a job. Hopefully you'll find a, a good employee. If you're looking to get a job, go in there and um, look for job postings. Speaking of hiring, my company, Lander Analytics, we are hiring. And I know that not everyone can announce it, but since I'm on screen, I'll tell you that I'm hiring. Um, we are looking for a few roles. We're looking for like a technical sales role or a full-on sales role too. We have a few sales roles. And we're looking for a data scientist, Linux administrator role. So if you're looking for any of those jobs, want to come work for what I think is a fun company and I think is an awesome boss, uh, come talk to me. You all know how to find me, right? On Slack, email, Twitter, I'm findable in many, many ways. So. Come find me if you want to do sales or data science roles or Linux administrator roles. I think it'll be a really fun company to work for and I'm not biased in the slightest. So I know we all can't be together and it's really sad, but keeping up tradition, I got my pizza. All right, this comes from Joe's Pizza. I'll do the, the cheese lock test. Cheese is holding on very nicely. Some good charring on the backside. So I hope everyone is enjoying their pizza. And let me know in the chat uh, where you are um, let me know where your pizza's coming from or whatever snacks you want to have tonight. Selena had a cheese croissant. Well, that sounds that'd be tasty. That sounds great. Daniel Chen, you miss New York City pizza. I know you do. Well, we're getting you back up to New York soon, though. Um, anybody else? Let me know where you're eating or what you're drinking or whatever you're doing. Let's, we can't do this for real, so let's at least try to pretend like we are con, con, uh, being convivial together. All right, well, while I wait for everyone else to tell me where they've eaten, pizza from Buffalo, great. Uh, Boston, your pizza looks like pork chops and rice. That's a very interesting looking pizza. Uh, I like it. All right. Um, and we have Nicholas from Buffalo. So anyone hope everyone's enjoying their food. I know you don't come here for the food. You come here for the stats, but you stay for the food. That's what we'll say. All right. So a few things you can be doing virtually. Oh, Tommy's getting his pizza looks like a beer. We have steak baba ganoush bowl. That sounds great. Uh, a pomegranate white tea in the DC area. Pomegranate white tea sounds very refreshing, Devin. I, I, I'm with you on that. I, I can dig that. Sounds very refreshing. I'm a little, I have tea envy right now. All right. Um, some things coming up, other events you can attend. Uh, this week, I believe starting Wednesday, but actually might have already started. I'm not quite sure. I should know the specifics. Um, you can check the email I sent out to everybody last week, I believe. There's a conference for Neo4j. It's a graph database. They have their conference in the, I think their workshops were last week, but the conference itself is this week. So you can sign up if you want more information. It is available at meetup.com in our events channel. I think Nicole will post it in the events channel or she's already posted it there. Um, just go there, click that link. I know there's definitely Dan Chen is here missing New York City Pizza. He'll be uh, moderating some of the stuff there. So you can check him out and check out this great, uh, great event. Um, speaking of conferences, we announced it formally. Tickets are on sale. The New York R Conference. We are very, very excited to be hosting the New York R Conference, both in person and virtual in September. We had a calendar snafu, so we changed a few things on the schedule. 
The workshops will now be September 1st. And then the conference itself will be September 9th through 10th. Yes, I know they're a week apart. That makes it hard for people if you're traveling to New York City, but everything will also be offered virtually. So if you want to do the workshop virtually, then attend the conference in person or flip it around or do both one way or the other, you can. So remember folks, September 1st and September 9th through 10th, uh, the New York R Conference. And Nicole just posted a link uh, because I am a little challenged for doing that, apparently posting links. She posted it in um, the chat, rstats.ai slash NYR. Steven, you're coming to New York. That's exciting. We're glad to have you there. Um, and if anyone here, you're all members of the meetup, this conference grew out of the meetup. Those of you who've been around for a long time know that I said, if we do a meetup every month, let's do a conference, a two-day event. So for you members of this meetup, there is a discount code, NYHackR, same as our website. That's our slogan, our logo, our, our catchphrase, whatever the right word is. Use code NYHackR to get you 20% discount. We are very excited about that. Uh, and I see, oh, Selena, she just told me she's coming. She's a former speaker. Oh, and Selena, Selena is giving artwork that will be auctioned off. I'm not sure she knew that yet, but she did last time. Uh, Selena, we want to auction your art again. So please uh, get it to us. And we're doing every year at this conference for the past few years, thanks to Thomas Levine who started it, we auction off art um, made by the art community. And all the money goes to the R Foundation and I believe the another foundation, I can't remember the name of right now, but definitely the R Foundation. Some examples of the art we've auctioned in the past is actually um, by Jacqueline Knowles behind me, Greeting from Statistics. Uh, I got this commission later on, a painting by Vivian Peng. And I believe behind Emil, we've also auctioned off in the past also, uh, the Neural Network Layers. That's like such a perfect speaker to have here with the art already. <laughs> Thank you, Emil, for having that. All right, other events we have coming up. We have a stand workshop. Every year we've done a stand workshop with Jonah Gabri, Andrew Gelman, Rob Tranguchi, and a bunch of other rotating people coming through. Um, we're very excited to do this again this year. It's gonna be virtual because we're not quite ready to open up um, in person yet, July 14th through 16th. I will hopefully successfully post the link inside the, uh, the chat to this. Let's see if this works. All right. That's the link to learn more about the STAM workshop. We do it every year. Every year, it's completely different content. Me and my team attend every year, and every year, we're like, oh, wow, we did not know any of that because they keep changing the content. And we've actually seen attendees come repeatedly because they keep learning new stuff. So if you want to learn about STAN, which is Bayesian, Markov Chain, Monte Carlo, come to this. It's always a great time. Jonah Gravery is going to be leading it. I believe Rob Tranguchi will be assisting, and Andrew Delman will do his, his normal pop-in like he does every year. We are very excited about that. The day before the STAN workshop, we have the July meetup with Sean Taylor on July 13th. That'll be announced in the coming days. Sean Taylor will be, I don't even know what he's going to be talking about, but it's Sean Taylor. So we're all going to check it out because it's awesome, right? Uh, so Sean Taylor, who's spoken a few times at the meetup before, and he's spoken at the conference, will be speaking virtually at the meetup July 13th. So everyone, you'll get that announcement coming up very soon. Then in August, we will have Ian Cook speaking virtually at the meetup. So we have the next two months planned. It's so nice when things are planned in advance. August will be Ian Cook. We are really looking forward to that. And then I'm really excited about this. We don't have any details yet, but we will be returning to an in-person and virtual meetup in September. We always like to have a meetup the same week as the conference. Again, due to our calendar screw up, it'll be the same week as the workshop this time. Uh, so September 1st or 2nd, we're gonna have an in-person meetup and we'll be doing it virtually and in person. We'll do both to make sure everyone can still participate. We're very excited about returning to in-person meetups to coincide with the in-person conference. Now, we're not going in-person until September because I know a lot of things are opening up, especially New York City thing, they're having fireworks tonight to celebrate New York City opening up again, but we're not quite ready to do that yet. One of the main reasons is we can't get space to host us yet. Most of our, all the companies that usually host us are not comfortable hosting until September. And even then we don't have it fully planned out yet. We do fully intend to come with the meetup to coincide with the conference in September. But if you work for a company and you have office space, please let me know if you would like to host the meetup physically and let us in your office to have us in there. We need about at least a hundred seats more, I think we'll feel even more people are going to be coming um, than usual. 
We used to be able to fill a room with 300 seats, but we don't have that much space anymore. So if anyone has a company that would like to host the meetup, let me know. Be in touch with me on Twitter, on Slack, by email, by instant message, by any way you want. Let us know if you have office space somewhere, um, preferably in Midtown or below. That's where you get easy for people to get to and they have to get to the train or the subway afterwards. Let me know if you can host us. That'd be really great because we're always in search of space. Until then, we are still virtual and we will continue to be hybrid going forward. I'd like to thank Eco Health Alliance for providing the Zoom. Uh, so thank you, um, Noam Ross and Emma. Oh, I'm Emma. I'm forgetting your last name. Mendelssohn, I think. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Noam and Emma, for providing the Zoom link for us this entire past 14 months. It's been really, really helpful. So I want to say thank you. As we get started, if we have questions for our speaker, we obviously can't ask the questions directly. So use the chat right here in Zoom or send a question to the Slack channel called Monthly Meetup Chat. There is a channel called Monthly Meetup Chat, where if you guys, folks, sorry, if you folks just want to talk about what's going on or ask questions, do it in there. And if it's a question for a mill, I will ask it at the end. I'll collate all the questions and then I will ask at the very end um, and, and ask it on behalf of everybody because we can't all jump right in. So again, if you want to ask a question, post it here in Zoom or post it in the monthly meetup chat in Slack. So there's a lot of announcements, the key takeaways. If you want a job, post in the jobs, eat your pizza, Neo4j conference this week, our conference in September, stand workshop next month, meet up with Sean Taylor next month, meet up with Ian Cook in August, returning to in-person and virtual for almost everything, for uh, at least for this meetup group in September. That's a lot of stuff. So with that, I hope everyone had a good time um, and hopefully, well, hope you're gonna have a good time. And um, I'll bring us the next speaker who is very appropriate to speak on this topic, given that um, his history of text recipes. Uh, and I hope everyone's going to have a good time enjoying this. Please, everyone, give a warm virtual welcome to Emil. Thank you so much, Jared. And thanks for having me. It is wonderful to see such a, a flawlessly organized meetup continuing for years and years. Thank you. I will be talking about uh, test pre-processing. My name is uh, Emil Wittfeld. Uh, if you have a hard time pronouncing it, remember that both the H and D is silent. I know it just makes life a little bit more exciting when names aren't pronounced as they're written. So just a little bit about me. I am a clinical data analyst at Celebrate Health. I'm also spending a little bit of my uh, part uh, my other time, I'm teaching at American University. I'm teaching statistical machine learning, and I'm trying to do a new tidy model, which is very exciting. I'm also a maintainer of almost a dozen different packages on train. The top is usually a wall around color palettes, working with text, and tidy models uh, interactions. And I'm also, uh, Julia and I are working on a book called Supervised Machine Learning for Test Analysis in R. It's quite a mouthful. We couldn't find a shorter title that really explained what it's about. And that one's coming out very soon. Wait for the end of the talk for a little bit more information about that. I'm located in Southern California. Uh, and uh, with my wife, been here for since 2017. And I'm living here with uh, my three cats. And I'm sure everybody wanna know, they want pictures, so here we have, we have Presto, Orion Whittles, the siblings, they're around two years old, and they're very happy here. They're a little hard right now because we're having a heat wave. All right, so in interesting aside, let's step on to it. So I thought it was appropriate to start with this quote from Hadley Whitham, which states that most of data science is counting and sometimes dividing. And I find this to be ringing true quite a lot, but I wanna modify it a little bit because I also think that most of text pre-processing is counting and sometimes dividing. And this is really what uh, I wanna talk about today. So the first question we really have is what are we counting? So we have some text coming in and what are we really counting? So let's start with just a sample of some text 
I have this uh, R package, animals, or never the wrong train, but it has a lot of really long form explanation of different animals. So if we look at this example of what a beaver is, we see a lot of text, different things. And I'm stating earlier that we want to count something in this text. So if we load it a little bit, we might think, oh, we can like chop off, like chop it around a little bit and we can count that. So one way, if you're just thinking, it might be a good idea to just chop it off by sentence by sentence. But what you really run into if you chop everything into sentences is most of them tend to be unique. So the first sentence, beavers are most well-known for the distinctive form building that they receive in rivers and streams is very much likely a completely unique sentence unless it's being copy pasted from wherever I got this data set. And any sentences that will be repeated might not have that much information. So we wanna find a smaller unit that is easily countable. Another thing we could do is count individual characters or letters in this case, or letters and punctuation and numbers. And we certainly could do this, However, we lose so much information in this because we took that a distribution of how often the different characters appear, but it, it, it doesn't really tell us that much. It might help us a little bit with language identification because different languages use different uh, words, which then are then use different uh, letters. So we did a slightly different letter distribution. But I just said that different words are being used differently across different languages and domains. So maybe the idea of a word would be something that we count out and depending on how we find the words and depending on how we count it, we might be able to use that information later down the line. So before I move on, I think it's very important that I give a disclaimer that everything we're talking about right now uh, will use its samples in English. And I think it's very important with uh, any kind of time you're working with text to follow the Bender rule, which states that you always should say what language you're working with, even if you're working with English, because the statement, we solved question and answering in text is not equivalent to we solve question answering using English text. So even though English appears to be everything that happens in NLP, it's very important that we state up front what we're working with. And also the difficulty of different tasks related to NLP and working with text uh, is going to be different depending on what language you're working with. Some tasks would be easier in English and some of them would be really hard. In English. So it would be very hard to do anything with a generalized sense. And lastly, a small reminder that the language is very much different than text. And this, uh, you might, if you are testing someone that is significantly younger than you, you might have noticed that sometimes you get um, disagreement about how to test with everybody. I'm in the way, I'm in that little middle spot of knowing that people older than me will use ellipses as a natural pause and people younger than me will use ellipses in testing as a, oh, that doesn't really matter that much. So a lot of things differ. So just because we're saying we're solving this thing, it's very important we're working with text and not languages. And another thing just drawing out sort of English, there's many languages, that doesn't have a written style. Most languages start as spoken language and then some of them will turn to written. So the goal of this process of test pre-processing, uh, and we say test pre-processing because it's typically something we have to do before we apply some of our statistical or machine learning models, is the task of turning our text. So imagine that 
big paragraph we saw before. It needs to be turned into numbers. And more specifically, it needs to be turned into numbers because we need something that's machine readable. Most of the statistical methods and machine learning methods requires the input to be numeric in one way or another. And even uh, the, some of the methods that can take things like factor variables will actually turn it into numbers down the line, just hide it for you as a user interface helping. And uh, what uh, I like to find out in this turning text to numbers is that there will be some kind of loss along the way. We lose some of the info, like, so this becomes a like a non-reversible transformation. Much like we lose some information from going to speech into text because we don't have enough the mannerisms, we don't have the tone, we lose a lot of things from going from speech to text, we lose more by going from text into numbers. And I also want to point out that a lot of the things we've been talking about today will be language and implementation at master. And here I'm meaning language both in the term of the spoken language we're working with, but also the programming language we're working with. But I'll be showing uh, samples of how to do this in text recipes, because that is uh, what selfishly I think is one of the best implementations that can handle some of these things. So some of the existing packages to deal with text in R, because this is what uh, we're working with. I want to highlight two of them. We have the tidy text and the quantita, and they deal with slightly different things. The tidy text is a smaller package, and it does a really, really great job of doing EDA or what is also always called uh, text mining and also has some tools to work in the top of modeling. But tidy test works because the tidyverse already exists. So it's leveraging a lot of tools uh, from the dplyr tidy up package that allows us to seamlessly work testing that way. So tidy test doesn't stand alone, it enhances the tidyverse the ecosystem. Whereas Trantiva is more of a whole ecosystem approach and it can do most everything. It starts all the way from the beginning, ingestion, data pre-processing, all the way to different kinds of modeling. Everything happens in one framework. Now this is where, where I come in with test recipes. Test recipes tries to handle a couple of different things. It is limited at them to only do test pre-processing or feature engineering. So it only goes in the step of I have the data and I'm turning it into numbers. Anything after that it doesn't want to do, anything before that it doesn't want to work for. It is part of the tidy models framework in the sense that it is an add-on package to the recipes package, leveraging uh, a lot of the, the hard work that has been happening in recipes and just Initially, latches on and uses all the great engineering that happens in there. Another thing, it doesn't create any custom objects. So if you can use recipes and learn how to use recipes, you can more or less seamlessly use test recipes as well. It doesn't require a lot of knowledge of strange objects. It technically has custom objects, but they're all used uh, internally. So hopefully you can see. And uh, by being part of recipes, uh, it doesn't restrict us to only use text as features. So one thing I've noticed, especially in beginner material around the, uh, the web, that if you look at something like text uh, classification, something like that, they will only show you how to use text to uh, be features in some modeling later on without mentioning that we can also use non-test features alongside. So this is uh, where test recipes test start to shine. And you might think that this is the whole, oh, there's a lot of competing frameworks. I will develop a new one, have even more, and I can't dispute this claim. But I'm hoping that 
uh, what I have here is a worthwhile companion in the uh, test preprocessing heater system. And just a couple of notes of why the system doesn't work. Tidy test works really, really well when you're doing test mining, if you want to look at what's happened. If you want to repeat the transformations later on, if you run into issues, since it's in a long format, it, you need to take a lot of steps to make sure that it becomes that you don't lose su uh, sufficient information going back to a wide format, which is something test with these handles. Concealer is also great because it's a whole e ecosystem thing, which would make it really which would make it a little harder to work with. Um, uh, tiny models, but you might get like a clash of feature systems. I have plans to incorporate some of it later down the line, but it's for me, it made more sense to do a smaller building block. And the most important thing that test with can do is it can learn transformation on some data and apply the same transformations to new data. And this comes for free by using recipes. And just to uh, limit everything so talk doesn't end up being five hours. Uh, I'm limiting myself and uh, test recipes to work with uh, tabular data. So it doesn't do any draft things. It, everything starts in tipples and ends in tipples. And uh, it comes a little bit from my like personal development uh, philosophy that or rather that some people have good foundation then always work on the cutting edge, especially because I feel that some of these ideas that I'm talking about in this, in this course uh, isn't explained very in depth for other places. So this is what I'm trying to remedy. So if you just look right here, we have an example of a recipe and I'm using on the animals data set that I just loaded in. And if you notice, um, there's a lot of different steps, but what you will see is we start with some steps about some other variables. We have uh, a factor variable lifestyle and a numeric variable mean weight, and we can do some transformation on those. And then afterwards, we can do some transformation to the test. So everything can work together, which is really the power of test recipes. And what we're really going on is we have four steps, more or less, when we are doing test pre-processing. First step is we're turning the test into some smaller units, we call those tokens. Then we can modify the tokens or remove some of the tokens we don't want. And lastly, we'll take the tokens into the numbers. So these are the four steps uh, test uh, pre-processing more or less about, and I'll go through them one by one. So first we'll talk of tokenization. So that is almost always the first thing you will do when you're working with text. If you don't have, if you're not, the only really other thing you to, to do is make sure that uh, all your test encoding is done correctly because that can be a very big headache down the line. And tokenization is really the task of taking a big blob, blob of text and turn it into something smaller units and something we can count. And this is very important because when we're working with text, we generally don't have a fixed width that we can do. So we have we can do a little bit in something like uh, Twitter, because we're limited by 280 characters. But what we can't, what we want to count, which typically works, or other units don't have a limit of how many you can do. So it becomes different. So we want to find a way to count something. So this is where we go to tokenization. And the most common token is typically the word. So we want to find a way to date our test and find out where the word is. But there's many different um, options when you take into consideration when we take our test and turn it into words. And uh, we're very fortunate as uh, English speaking people because the idea of what, of what a word is 
is quite clear, but and we can actually find that just splitting our string by white space works really, really well by itself. Like you will run into different things that like what is like a fire truck? Is it one word? Is it two words? There is afternoon, like there's a couple of words that feels like they might be one word, but a technically split and so on and so forth. But generally, uh, the idea that we can split very easily in English. And this is not the case in the four languages. I did uh, Selena in the chat saying that Turkish, it thinks a little bit different. Also Chinese, it thinks different because the notion of a word can be one or more, more one or more less. So tokenization in English is quite an easy task because the defaults work quite well. This can be a very different case in our languages. So here I'm taking my B white sample and I'm just splitting it by white space. I'm just using a string split and this uh, red is just all by white space. And we see that it looks fairly well with that. What appears like words, there's some weird things on it, like, like uh, punctuations, things that we live down here. Uh, Twitch included the, the time and strong included the period, but more or less, that is, but more or less, we've already did pretty well just by using spaces. If you've done any kind of word, uh, and I, you probably come around, come around to the tokenizers package, it provides a wide variety of tokenizers and the default tokenized words works really well as well. We did something that really looks like word, it does a lot of splitting. Unfortunately, it is hard <laughs> to actually define these rules. So the tokenized words uses uh, the a word boundary algorithm in stringy package. And here is the, the short outline of what it actually tries to achieve. And the, the full documentation is many, many dozens of pages explaining all the little things, why it works and why it doesn't work. Because there's a lot of different edge cases to deal with, but this totalized words works really well, but also is a vastly more complex method. But with that in mind, there's a couple of things we should take into consideration. First of all, do we need to uh, turn any uppercase letters into lowercase? We saw before, we just do that. We see in the first one, beavers stay uppercase. When we use tokenized words, it gets turned into lowercase, and so on. Tokenized words defaults to turning it into lowercase. What does it, what information are we losing when we turn uppercase letters into lowercase letters? That will depend on your task. Do you really tap in many in, in English? Uppercase letters usually means as a proper noun or beginning of a sentence. Does that matter a lot? If you're working with someone that likes to eat a lot, if you're working with tests with people that really like Apple products, but also really like to eat fruit, you might need the distinction between an upper taste apple and a lower taste apple, but sometimes you don't. So that is a judgment call for you to make, but it's a choice you need to make because you, that's, uh, it's a body thing, different ways to do that, that may or may not uh, should be butted to do. Another thing is punctuation. How do you deal with it? A general default is just to remove every punctuation, punctuation, but sometimes that can be important as well. Sometimes removing punctuation can even split up words that were all wise hyphenated. So a bunch of different punctuations right there. And that's what I said before. Well, how do you deal with non-word characters, non-word characters inside words? And when I mean by non-word, it's like, what if it's not an alpha? Like alpha number, just an alphabet character. So in a word like don't, it is a, a contraction, but should we keep it as one word or two words? There's a bunch of different considerations right there. 
And what do we do with tampon wells and multi wells? But how do we do with this? Uh, it's a, this is, can be very important with things like top mounts or other names of more things. The White House is, for many people, one unit. It's not white in a house, it is a specific unit. And if you're not careful about how we deal with this, it doesn't pop up as easy. Um, so, uh, there's other problems as well. And I'm not at hand to the answer to most of this. A lot of the, uh, the, the translations right here will, turn, will be directly related to the data you're working with and what domain you're using. But I wanna highlight these are things that, that should be considered. Another thing right here, we have uh, just a short uh, vector of strings, of flowers, bush, and flowers. And we would imagine that if you table this, we just say like there's two flowers and one bush. But now that I run it, we see that there's two different flowers. And what is happening right here is the first flowers had a literature uh, combining the F and L into one uh, character. And this can look really, really nice for some types of presentations because it looks a little bit more sleek, but it can mean that you like basically, it, the computer doesn't know by default that these are different. So um, that's another thing. These words will not be counted, these two flowers will not be counted as the same word. And you can, but there's different ways of dealing with this as well. Uh, couple of more things. One thing is like, how do you even begin to talk about slang? And domain knowledge, I like to think of domain knowledge to really emphasize what it is, is by saying that everything you see in Wikipedia will be vastly different than everything you see on Twitter. The way we're speaking is different. We don't have a word count on Wikipedia. We can use slang punctuation starts mattering a lot more in uh, social media posts in a personal things. So what, how do we lump things together? This is probably more of a post, like more of an after tokenization thing. We say all these wilds should be turned into one, but whether they are different wilds or separate wilds will matter, like 10 sometimes matter. And also what you have is there's only one person doing this super long while. If we, don't lump it in, it might not have, it might not show the signal it otherwise had if all the slightly different permutations are being counted separately. And lastly, to really like show why TED is a pain to work with all the time, is that how do we deal with emojis? Like emojis words, like are they modifiers? So here we have let's get some tattoos. We're just taking the word tato, replacing it with the emoji for tato. It appears what, like this. Most people can easily understand what that is. And it is just a real replacement. But the test, I love you, little red heart. Everybody also understands, but the, the note, what quantities this emoji has is quite different. No one is saying, I love you heart as a thing. It becomes a modifier to um, to the sentence itself. It can change quite a lot. So the the phrase "you're out of your mind," sad, like like angry face, is quite a bit different than "you're out of your mind," happy um, happy heart face. Uh, and this a lot of this can become. Um, this, like this idea of emojis, I think, can a lot of times be used to uh, inject back some of the tone that we lost in turning something into text. And what I'm really trying to say is that the domain you're working in matters. So uh, uh, pre-processing text pipeline that works in the legal text framework is not going to work 
as well when you apply to social media posts or to, to job postings or like anything else. It just depends. And you need to know what the differences are. You need to know, have someone on your team that understands your domain. So you can adequately adjust. And the way uh, test recipes try to deal with this, is acknowledge that there's a, many, many ways to do this and will let you uh, do whatever. It has a couple of different defaults and helper ways to do it, but doesn't tie you down. Um, so uh, with default to tokenizers, you can pass in your own. We also have bindings to other languages or even packages, like other languages and other packages and even languages. So uh, defaults, tokenizers, tokenized words. You can also pass in some of the arguments. So if you don't want to strip punctuation and you don't want to turn anything to lowercase, you can modify the original um, tokenizer. If you wrote your own tokenizer, so if I wrote a function called my amazing tokenizer, you can pass it in and that tokenizer will be used and it will be saved in the recipe. So when you apply it then later, it will know we can also use the Sparsi tokenization engine. So Sparsi is a wonderful uh, Python library to do text, um, text word. And the Sparsi package creates a binding in R. We can use that underneath it as well. It can do much more rich uh, tokenization with some loss in, uh, in speed sometimes. There's also this, uh, tokenization idea of a uh, byte pair encoding. It, there's a different idea of what a word is. It finds common strings of characters. We have that as well. And we even have support for methods where we have trained models that do tokenization. Like the odd pipe, we can pass in a odd pipe model, the odd, the odd pipe model into a recipe and that is the one that will be used. And if you have any anything, any other tokens which you want support for, it's a little harder, uh, please reach out. We're happy to uh, add as much uh, any use case as possible. Stemming. So stemming is put as a title, but actually what I wanted to talk more about is the act of, mo act of modifying tokens once they have become tokens. So we start with tokenizer, it splits the test into many smaller things, typically words, but it can be other things as well, it's syllables. And we want to modify them in some way or another. And the most common way we want to modify them is to reduce cardinality. So we have a bunch of different tokens that some of them are kind of saying the same thing. It could be um, some of those, some other things but we also have things like uh, house and houses. So is there, do your model need a distinction between what a house is, like counting a house and counting houses? If you don't want a distinction, stemming might be one of those options to do. So in R, oh, sorry, in English, we have like two main ways, the Porter stemmer, which is this algorithm outlining the different steps you can do to remove Ending. So most of stemming takes a word and removes things from the end, which of course is a very English thing to do because a lot of beginnings means a lot. And, and even more simpler ways of stem is just removing S's at the end. This is a much simpler algorithm, but can also work fairly well. And the way I like to think of it is we have a bunch of different tokens and they each have a bucket, but we're timing them in, we're dating, have, have some uh, battery word, data word, put it in the corresponding bucket. So uh, stemming is more or less the act of combining buckets that should be the same. And a bunch of different ways of doing this. Here, I'm just showing three different, like four, not three different ways. First column, we're seeing the original word. Uh, the second column, we are removing the S. Third column, we're working by like, like plural endings. 
and the last one we're doing the porter stemming. And we see that there are some differences in what happens to these words. Noticeably, the porter stemmer doesn't always produce valid words in the end. And it's doing this to help uh, combine things. We see that a lot of times Y turns into I. If it's in the end, uh, the porter stemmer can remove uh, many characters, but it's a way to try to combine things back down. And different methods do different things. The porter stemmer has other, uh, so the S removal algorithm is very English. So it probably doesn't work a lot of all languages. The polar stemmer is tailor made to work in English, but there's other um, there's similar algorithms written for other languages. And this is just another example of why it's really important that you need someone on your team that also knows the language you're working with. Because it could be that if you apply this remove ending S algorithm, some other languages you might lose a lot of information. This could be like the difference that everything makes for certain words. And these are very easy to uh, apply as well. Uh, test with piece defaults to the portal stemmer, which is implemented in the Snowball C. It is fun factoid. Uh, it's called Snowball because originally they wanted to call the, the method stripper. And someone told them that might have not have been the best idea to name it that. So they found a, a, a potentially less offensive word. So they went with snowball. But yeah, so it can default to apply to the, the porter stemmer. Uh, you can also pass in your own stemming function if you have one. So if you want to remove ending S's, you can do that easily as well. And There's also this idea of lemmatization. So this is a, a so most stemmers will be some kind of algorithm in like an if else statement ways. It's hard coded, and it is very simplistic and more importantly, it works very fast because a lot of them can be written as a a, a record or two. Lemmatization is the next step where we are trying to a lot of times build a model that learns the structure, tries to learn the patterns in the data and remove some endings. And we have a couple of implementations of this. We can use a SPASI implementation has a trained model in it and a hot pipe also has a trained model. So the way we can do this is if we set the engine uh, to SPASI in uh, step tokenize, then you can later use step lemma and it will pull out the limitization of those words. So uh, because limitization happens at tokenization time, using spatial, we are, it is extracted out this way and you can do this for all our limitization methods. So far, we only have support for Spacia and other type, but I'm trying to add more when we go along. And there's other things we can do. You can also pass in custom functions to step stem to do any kind of transformation you want. The next thing I want to talk about, which uh, is called stop words, I'm not asking you to stop, um, is um, I want to say a controversial topic, mostly because there's a lot of ambiguity of what it really means. And this is really my section where I want to talk about removing words. So we started off splitting things into words, then we took and modified some of them, mostly we uh, removed endings, but that's the thing you can do in English. There might be other things you do in other languages. My stop words section is we want to remove words. So I want to start by uh, talking about stop words. And to really explain what stop words are, let's just go to the internet because that's where everybody gets all the information from all the time. So the first one we have the natural language processing, useless word data are referred to as stop words. 
in computing, stop words are words that are filtered out before or after the natural language data are processed, or stop words are words in any language, which does not add much meaning to a sentence, it can safely be ignored without sacrificing the meaning of the sentence. So this is how I tend to look when I read the statements, because it gives the illusion that working with stop words are very easy. And if you just like, remove all the words, and there's no problem whatsoever. Another thing is some of those excerpts I saw was sometimes in even larger articles or books, most of uh, what it will be what they talk about in the is all the discussion about stop words. In uh, in Julia and I's book, um, we did read the whole chapter just to stop words because we felt that we really needed that kind of attention. And I just really wanted to like, what is stop words really like? In my view, I think that um, stop words are low information words then put that contribute little value to the task at hand. And uh, I think that the information of a word lives us on a continuum. So there's two things I want to take away from the first sentence. First one is low information. I mean, a lot of different things. I'm never saying something is no information, something low. And it, the value added is dependent on the task. So let's, let me show what I really mean with some pictures. So if we look at this test on the right side, I'm doing some visualization, and each red tank represents a word. And I'm saying high words will be bright and low high information words will be bright, low information words will not be bright. The first thing to think about is, are all the words containing uh, the same information? I was enough, like that definitely are some words that contain more. It also doesn't appear to be random. What, it, what happens? And like, there's no way of saying it's random or not. But as tall of always, it could be. We have a high variance information, so like the diamonds in the rough. So most of the words, no information, couple here and there, a lot of information. That's one way we can have it. Another way could be this like low variance kind of information where we did little clusters of high information and then like this out, out, like just a different way of thinking about it. And ideally what we think about, we have these words and some words have a lot of information and some words have less and less and less and removing stop words will have this cut off line. So we think that we're removing stop words and just removing everything else. But in reality, you probably end up with something like this. So you're hitting a cutoff and you're hitting most of the low information words, but you will eventually, unless you're very, very careful, also hit up some high information words. You can always slide it around to try to hit like different sections of where it is, but it's hard to really find the right cutoff. So we can handle this in two ways or combine them. We have a pre-made list. So that's, you find a stop word list out there. You pull things out of it or you can hand make the list. I recommend hand -made, hand making it to find all your words and find, make the list all the words you don't want to include and remove those because there's a bunch of problems with hand made lists in general. Uh, I talked about hand made lists as very easy, well constructed. There's very little ambiguity, but there is quite a lot of different English stop word lists out there. And this is just some of the ones out there. Another thing that can become very important is that the stop word lists are sensitive to the way you tokenize it, the way you tap digitalize the words, and if you did stemming before or after. So if you're using a pre made stop word list make sure that it matches everything that happened up to that point. So like that. Um, if you ever need to work with a non-English stop word list, 
basically hire someone that know that language. So you like use the language to edit. And that's even just general basic word for test, test. Have someone, at least some one person on the team that actually knows the language. Otherwise, you get into a whole host of trouble. And really, what it comes down to, I want you to look at your stop word list. And if it wasn't for time, I would have this slide five more times repeatedly at random, jumping out at you, because this is really, really important. You need to look at your stop word list. And I'm having a little quiz to explain why. So I'm trying to function stop word quiz. So I'm giving you half a minute to type in the chat which one you think is the odd one out in this list of words. So if you want to, you can join the chat, say which one to which one of these four words doesn't appear to have a relation to the other words. And it's fine if you don't want to, but it's just oh wait, I started the wrong timer. But my timer stopped on mine. So the odd one out here is she is. And this one is odd one out because it doesn't appear on smart stop word list, whereas the other three appears. So that's already like, hey, that seems weird that the two first stop, two first words on this list doesn't appear to her. Next, we have some other ones. You then have half a minute if you want to join. We have owl, bee, biffy, and system one. I'm looking for the one word that doesn't appear to match. Anything else? Seeing. Apparently, there's no way of you actually knowing which one is unless you've seen this talk before. But it would be any like all of these words are weird. They, like they shouldn't, none of them feels like no information words. And the correct answer here is 50, because 50 was part of a stop word list included in Scikit-learn that was undetected for three years. So everybody that used this stop word list using Scikit-learn removed 50, but not 50. And last one, uh, we have these long words. I would say that all of these words appear to be highly uh, informational. Uh, it seems weird that these would even be anywhere close to a stop word list. But nevertheless, that's why this part, this question is uh, on this quiz. And yeah, so like we have substantially, successfully, sufficiently, and statistically. Which one's the weird one? And with that, it's statistically that are correctly found in the chat because this one doesn't appear in the stop words the ISO list, whereas the other three do appear. So if you're using the ISO into stop word list, you're having quite a big list of words that would be removed. Um, so general idea: removing words is removing words you don't want to do. One of the things to be high frequency words, high frequency words tend to not have a lot of information in it, is words like are, and, or, it, the, they, that words appear a lot and they work more gluing to them. We can also remove low frequency words because if a word only appears once in 100,000 documents, can you really use it as signal for later modeling or is it just noise? And we can also remove stop words. If you use step stop words, it removes um, the snowball set. I was very hesitant about having a default. I don't think that removing stop words is always necessary, but the snowball one is the smallest, most commonly known one. You can also specify other lists. And this is using the stop words package. So we can also have other languages lists as well. I always recommend creating your own. It works better. We can also filter according to things about the data. So here we can say only keep the tokens that appear at least 10 times. And also remove tokens that appears too many times. These are very heavy handed. 
method. So you need to make sure you're not removing things you shouldn't. And for computational reasons, reasons we can also filter to only keep the most common thousand to thousand words, simply because when we turn this into a table in the end, if you don't use a filter for the number of tokens, we get a very, very large sparse data set that sometimes doesn't fit in memory. So we started with ending which are called embeddings, which is not the standard use of embeddings, but what is basically turning tokens into numbers. And we can do this a couple of different ways. For time, I won't be going too much into the math of what it's doing, but hopefully it makes a lot of sense. So the first thing we can do is count. So I'm using step under.tf, turn frequency. And what it's doing is it's just saying how many times does each word appear in each observation. So you see right here that the word able appeared seven times in this one, zero times in this one, four times in this one, and so on. Um, this does, um, we can also do a binary count. So basically saying, did this word appear or not? Sometimes it doesn't matter if a word appeared one time or a hundred times, as long as it appeared once, it's signal enough for us. That's one way of doing it. Another way to do this is using something called TFIDF. So term frequency, inverse document frequency. So we, we take how often, a uh, word appears and multiply it with how not often it appears in many different things. So if a word appears in basically all the different documents or observations, so it appears almost always, it has a really high IDF and it doesn't weigh as much. If it appears in only a subset, it starts appearing a lot. It becomes a kind of normalization. There's a bunch of different ways that can be written out and we have most of the variations in the step as well. There's also this idea of feature hashing. So before we had our uh, tokens and we just say when they appear, but we had to exclude a lot of tokens because otherwise we have like a have like half a million columns and we can't do that. And it has been super, super sparse because most pieces of text don't contain that large part of possible words used. So we use this thing called feature hashing. So feature hashing, hashing, what it will do, it will take each token, do a hash on it that maps it to a number, and then we bin it according to that number using a mod on it. So right now we do a hashing on all different words, uh, do mod 1025, and then the word pop in right here. And we can then increase, here I'm saying like if we're increasing, like decreasing the number of buckets in feature hashing, um, we can, we get some uh, collisions of so multiple different words will be ending up in the same hash after we take the mod of it. But it's a way of us finding a balancing act between uh, by finding a medium um, sparse uh, implementation. Main downside to this feature hashing is you can't go backwards. We also have classical word embeddings. So this uh, time and examples are word to word, fast test of love. Very super simplified view is we are making, we are building, uh, like we are trying to map all words, like all totems into a multi-dimensional uh, space. So a point in space will represent one token. And we try to build it to satisfy some conditions of distances. And then we can use those vectors that represent each word later down the line. Um, in our framework, since we're working with mostly tabular data. I'm starting with a table, ending with a table. We can't really do that as much. We have methods in test recipes that will take, find the vectors for each, uh, embedding vectors for each token, and we can then combine them together. 
so we can just sum them, take the mean or match of them. They don't work well because it's uh, just a constraint, but sometimes it can be helpful. So we have that here. We have word step, word embeddings, the dividend embedding, and say how to aggregate it, and you will do that. Uh, this doesn't work well. All right. So um, to kind of round it out, one of the reasons why I really like these top based methods is because we did a great deal of interpretation on them. So we, there's a lot of talk lately which is heard about uh, algorithmic bias. And a lot of this talk is related to uh, these large language models. And one of the issues with these large language models is they're very hard to tease out what how they make those decisions. And one of the benefits of everything I've shown so far is most of these are count-based. And we also not count that many things. So it's feasible for a human to go through all the different words we're considering and see, is this the word to consider or not? So there is, we can inspect our model a little bit easier. We use these simple account-based methods. And also a lot of them, they work pretty well. Like you can, Generally, my modeling uh, advice is you always start low to something simple, even if you can start with a linear regression model and build up. But sometimes you don't need the multi-headed, multi-layered deep neural network. Sometimes something simpler will do it for you. And everything I talked about works as a pre-processing step. Uh, so everything you'll do after that will change how it is before. So are you using this in topic modeling? Are you using this supervised modeling? Things will matter uh, depending on how you do this last step of turning the tokens into numbers. You will do something very sparse or something not sparse at all. And the choice of model later down the line will make a difference. If you want to know more about all of this, uh, as I said in the very beginning, the Lucidia and I are writing this book. It goes uh, much more in depth with everything, everything I talked about so far, covers like the first third of the book, more or less. The other two chapters, there's much more detail of all the considerations you need to do, how to uh, remedy them. Then we go into how to apply, use tests in a supervised sense, both with deep learning and non-deep learning methods. And it's available for free or now at most any online retailer that, uh, most online retailers that will, uh, most online retailers that will sell a very specific uh, And that is all I have. You can find me most everywhere online. Uh, using Neil Beachball with or without underscores. Anything else? And of course, all the slides are created with some engine. So that is all I have. Thank you very much. A uh, big round of applause virtually, everybody. Uh, let's uh, see those uh, clap emojis in the chat. And I'll make sure everyone can see me <laughs> in a little golf clap here. I see a few people clapping in there. Yep. Unfortunately, we can't do what we do in person, giving you real applause. So everyone here is clapping <laughs> for you. So that's very nice for everybody. So uh, I see there's we have a few questions in there. I had to ask the last question first because it's fresh and top of mind. Is please <laughs> pronounce your last name again slowly so this person can sound smart saying your name. All right. So uh, it's Emil. So if you're any anywhere close to the southern border, you've heard the name Emilio. It's without EO. That's the easiest way of explaining people. And my last name is Wittfeld. And if it's silent H, silent D. Can you spell that, it phonetically in the chat? No, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a, it's a, and it's a fairly rare name where I'm from as well. So it's, oh, wow. So that doesn't help. And the person who asked that asked that in the panelist thing uh, privately. So I'm not going to name who it is, but I hope you person um, heard, got that. Okay. <laughs> uh, did Ken Brooks get it right? Uh, Vitfeld? Yeah, like I think that's the, if you, if you read it like that, most Americans will get it right. All right, cool. 
thought that in a second, so thank you for that. Um, then questions about the talk. Um, is there a recommended order of operation between normalization tasks, like too low or removing punctuation and tokenization? It's like, what is the recommended order of operations there? Yeah. So, uh, so those two specifically doesn't matter. It has uh, doing like uh, tokenization isn't affected by capitalization in English. So for those two, it doesn't really matter, but the order does matter really when you're working with stemming and uh, stop word removal. So some stop word lists, most of them work on unstemmed words, but every once in a while you will have a stop word list that works with stemmed words. Another thing you've, that I think that happened in the cited land methods was most words, I think what it was that words that was only two characters long just automatically removed. Which of course, like you have to know that beforehand because you might, <laughs> everything else like breaks down if you don't, don't know that. So it, a lot of it, if you really want to know, look at your stop word list, and I just said, look at your stop word list, look at all the words, do they make sense? And do they actually match out? And look at the totals you have left after we move the stop words to see if some of them slip through or not. Okay. And it's funny you mentioned um, looking at the stop word list. I remember the Titan text package had ways to, like, to exclude stop words, I believe. Am I getting that correct? Yeah. So uh, the, the Titan text package has this uh, function that I think called dead stop words that returns a tipple in using, I think it's the ISO, smart and snowball stop word list all together. And you just do some anti join on it. And that, if you're using the tidy text, that's a pretty big stop word list compared to just using the individual ones. So you might remove words that you maybe not have wanted to remove. Especially all those lists, well, that list will include any kind of pronouns. Okay. So if you need pronouns for some reason, then uh, don't use that, that list. Right. And uh, this is coming from me now. Um, would you say this uh, uh, text recipe supersedes tidy text? No, it's a completely uh, where it's uh, alongside. Uh, it, I wouldn't recommend to use it as an EVA tool because it's, it doesn't, it's not that transparent of what happens. But once you know the transformations you want to do, it puts in a rigorous framework to do it well. Okay. But looking at what happens in the intermediate steps are quite hard. Okay. All right. Um, the next question is, any plans to support hugging faces tokenizers in the future? I have looked at it. I need, I haven't had the most time to look at it yet. If someone already has, our package that binds to it, I can add support for it. If I have to add support for hugging face tokenizers in R, it will take proportionally as long time to do it. But I would like to have support for that because they do really great work. So it sounds like something John Harmon should do. Um, he's in the, he's in the chat. John Harmon, I feel like hugging face is your thing. So I hope you will be uh, um, making this this contribution. You'll make a package for hugging face, then a mill could uh, use that in text recipes. See, open source working together. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think that to like, just hang, like add on to that, I'm not, I'm trying to rewrite as little code as possible. Hmm. Like I'm trying to, like the total masses package has a lot of great total masses. I'm not gonna touch it, I'm just gonna use it. Like just to limit my load. That makes sense. Um, that's a good thing. That's reuse, you know, open source. That can be explicit. Yeah. Um, in the step where you talk about removing fifty, um, is there a, a step spell check? I have been thinking about doing it. That the main, and like, it isn't really that hard. It's just a modification on it. It probably will happen, but I have it on my list of things I want to add. It's always a little scary because you don't have a human 
actually changing, <laughs> like overlooking what spell checks are happening. Mm -hmm. So it might actually do, and everybody has sent the wrong test because spell check took over and it had to be scary to put into production. That's but I, I will add it eventually because some people want it. That's a good point, Jeff. Um, the question about your book, uh, does the book cover Transformers? And no, it does not. It uh, stops like shy. It, it's, it, it then is a much simpler, like we start down low and build up and we don't go that high, really. It sounds like a second edition thing. <laughs> plan ahead, you gotta plan, plan ahead for the next edition. Another yeah. thing, we also limited of what you can do easily in R. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like that's that limited some of the choices we had. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, there's a recent question. Um, if you have new documents that you want to compare to an existing corpus, is there a way to in incrementally add it to the embedding, or do you have to do the whole thing all over again? So, if you think thinking of like, I think it was called live learning, it's you can update an existing recipe, and that's a recipe limitation or a test recipe limitation. So if you have more training data, is what I'm reading, then you need to retrain the whole thing, is what I'm reading. And that is not a test recipes limitation, that is a recipes limitation hmm. to do that. You, of course, if you're talking about you have some data that you need more transformations on, you can always ap apply your recipe to these new observations and do the transformation there. Okay. Um, there was talk about space CR. Is that a, like a wrapper around the uh, Python, Python library? Yes. So that is space CR. I think it's 10 in your but yeah, that, that is a wrapper around the, it's like a R API wrapper from, that uses Sparsi underneath the hood. It would be a little hard to work with simply because it's really hard to install R directly, <laughs> Python directly when you're working with R. So once you get it installed, mm -hmm. it works well. Yeah. Right. So like that, yeah, so it, it just uses that. And I'm trying, I have spent a couple of hours trying to write a more direct wrapper to Sparsi instead of going through the Sparsi wrapper because I feel like I don't need everything they need. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to, the Sparsi package tries to do everything Sparsi can do, but in R. Mm -hmm. I don't need everything. I just need these pre-processing steps. Mm. So if I can do that, we might have a slightly faster implementation. Um, here's another question that just came in. Where does POS tagging come into pre-processing? So uh, we can do that as well in set specific and include it. But if you're using uh, like a sparse CR, any token asset that adds a part of speech tagging, uh, there is steps to do that. That will like appear like fairly fast after you tokenize. But this is like a, almost an enrichment step. So you're taking some of our tokens and modifying them. So like, yeah, like, like somewhere in the middle, but that one shouldn't really be affected too much of what's happening around. Okay. So somewhere in the middle. Um, then um, that, that, remind, that reminds me of a question. There used to be a, a package I used called Mighty, I believe. I believe it was an information extractor. Um, I guess is that still, I guess, are information extractors, um, the old fashioned ones made seven years ago, still relevant in today's um, with, all, with embeddings and hashings and everything else? I don't know if I'm the right person to, and to answer that. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the, the correct answer. All right, here it is. It's, my, it's M, from MIT NLP. It's the MIT information extractor. And it looks like, oh, there was a commit a month ago to the right. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So maybe this goal is being actively developed. All right. Um, and then there's just, um, a question that's the UD, UD pipe, or I guess you, how do you pronounce that? How do you pronounce it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what does that get you versus um, some of the other engines? So uh, that engine is uh, a trained model, much like the Spasia. It's just a different kind of model, but it gives you in part of speech and lemmatization as well. Okay. So it's a more enriched uh, tokenizer, but it's a trained model. So you need like the, the actual trained object as part of it. All right. And is that different than UDP model or is UDP model on a typo? Might be a typo. Okay. <laughs> Might be top typo of the question. Um, we just got another question in. Um, what are some of your favorite feature engineering examples using text? Hmm. Well, so we have these general steps so that like, they're like like these are like like almost like the vanilla ones. We're just counting things, but what we're counting is different. You can all I like if you can find some kind of domain knowledge. So you can always craft other things like can I count the number of nouns? Can I count like things like verbs? Can I like basically you don't need to only use these tokens, you can also add in other functions or do different things calculate punctuation, calculate like even proportions of things in it. In the book, we have an example where there's a lot of censoring going on in the document. Of course, if you actually work with that data, you, just, you might be able to find a way without the censoring, but we had a lot of account that credit card numbers. So they were like always like four, 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 four digits. And if you did a normal tokenization on that, that would never, like they would very rarely repeat. But you could write a, a function that would just count how many times do these credit card patterns appear. So instead of having 10 to 16 different credit cards, you combine everything into one. So you might get some signal that way. So I really like the handcraft ones, which is all, all dependent on whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. The one that takes the most work. Yeah. <laughs> which are the hardest ones to write about because, and that's another thing, I'm, this is weird, like different because I'm not working with text on my day to day. So like that's another thing is like, I don't have, right now I'm not lucky enough to work with text. So I don't have many recent examples. Yeah, makes sense. One day, one day. One day. So if there, anyone who has just throw a, a bucket of text. Let's get all the text we can. And send it. Send it to Emil. <laughs> all right. I will give everyone else just one last chance to ask a question. Uh, if you have one now, now is your time to just slip it in right before the deadline, uh, right before the buzzer, because we are going to call it in a little bit. We'll just do some wrap ups. And if no one else has a question, I'll just give another 30 seconds. While, I, while we wait 30, 30 seconds for a possible question, I wanna say thank you, Emil. Uh, this was uh, wonderful. Um, uh, there, uh, oh, slided. Uh, oh, slided? I was trying to say sliced. Oh, sliced. Yes, yeah, so you wanna talk about sliced. I know Julia's been on there and Adira has been on there. So yes, go ahead, and tell us about sliced. I think that was like slice this right, right, like if you ever watched the, the show Chopped, it, I think I've heard it's a similar format because never actually watched Chopped, but it's a live two hour uh, data science competition. We have four, they have four contestants. They all uh, data data set that's two hours to do something on it. There's hidden features. So you could, they get special points if they do certain things that they don't know beforehand that they need to do and then they're judged. Uh, we are wild in the chat. And if I, let me see, I think they start in an hour, a uh, half an hour on Switch. Yeah. Forgot that it was tonight. So yeah, folks go tune in next. Is is it D-Rob and Julia on it again tonight or? Uh, not, uh, not today. Okay. I know Josiah was on it not too long ago. Yeah, Josiah two weeks ago, Julia a week ago. Next week of the art people, we have uh, 
Jesse Masterpat and David Robinson. Yeah, a lot of friends are in this week. So, so folks, yeah. these, these are people that have spoken at the meetup and the conference, attended a lot. So you can see, so if you can't see each other in person yet, you can still uh, see each other through, through this way. Yeah, yeah. Funny to chat. Yes. And there's one more uh, question. We'll sneak in, we'll allow this last one. Um, do you have any general thoughts about function words, i.e. pronouns, prepositions, as a signal? Uh, so it, it, like, they are sometimes useful depending on what domain you're in. So of course, if you, for some reason, which you probably rarely need to do, but if you really need to know someone's gender, pronouns are a great feature for that. <laughs> but if you need to do most everything else, pronouns don't mean anything. Hmm. Like I, I would say like, that and I mean, like and like one of my tapes is I feel like you rarely need gender anyway, like that's very rarely used at all. So, like, I, likewise, pronouns don't help us as much anyway. Mm -hmm. But it, it could be indicative of the type of test. So, some types of like domains don't use pronouns or really use pronouns, job listings tend to not use pronouns. Um, a group chat probably uses them a little bit more because we're talking about each other. So it, it then, as anything else, it depends. Depends, the favorite, uh, the, the favorite lawyer's answer, it depends. Yeah. Okay, great. So okay, let's again, virtual round of applause. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. And this all happened, by the way, folks, um, we had a virtual meetup a, a couple months ago, and I saw Emil was in attendance. So I said, hey, Emil, send me a message. You got to give a talk. And look at this. It happens. It's happened a lot. Through. And I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it actually worked. And this happens a lot. There's been a number of meetups where I saw someone in the virtual crowd and said, hey, send me an email so you can give a talk. And it works. So thank you, Emil, for sending that email and uh, being bold and following through on that. Uh, to everyone, remember, we have a bunch of events the next few months. We have the Stand Workshop, July 14th through 16th. We have Sean Taylor, July 13th. We have Ian Cook in August. And we have the Conference and Workshops for the Conference, September 1st, then 9th through 10th. So thank you everyone for being here. We'll announce the next meetup soon, and this talk will be posted online um, very shortly. And hopefully I'll see a bunch of you in person coming up. And those of you not, hopefully I'll still see you virtually. If anyone wants to give a talk, send me a message. Everyone, once again, another big round of applause, as loud as you can make it. I'm not going to hear it for Emil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, have a good night.